Brian. So glad I could have you on, sir. Absolute pleasure having you on. Um, no, I'm stoked. I'm stoked we could we could finally do it. Sorry about the delay. I know we've been talking about it for a bit. So and we're doing it. Yeah, we're, we're here. We're, we're men of our words, and we're doing it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I I had Maddie McLaughlin on. I had Matt Lampkin on. I have you on now. I'm getting for David soon. I'm gonna have the whole the whole gambit on. That's that's I'm the plan. I could get you, Dave. If you need Dave, I could get him. He lives about I'm, a mile away, so I could rope okay. him in. Well, actually, we're just gonna pause it now. We're gonna get him in here, and then we're just gonna do a twofer. I think that would perfect. Be nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, we'll just jump back in. You were born and raised in the San Diego area, correct? I was born in San Diego, and then I'm a Navy brat, so I moved. Actually, moved to Hawaii for about ten years. Um, wow, I was a baby, and then came back to San Diego, and then uh, stayed in San Diego until 2008, and then I moved up here to LA. So I've been up here ever since. So you get a good, good amount of traveling. You're you're doing some sightseeing early on. Yeah, all my like all my early memories were being a kid in uh, in Hawaii. So it was not a bad not a bad place to grow up. And then San Diego after that. So I can't really complain too much about that. It's not nice. bad places to be. Yeah, yeah. Would you, would you ever want to move back to Hawaii eventually? I've never, oh, man. I've never gotten to even go back and visit. So I know it's totally different. I'd love to go see it. I think I don't know if I don't know if I could ever live there. It might be I don't my my partner grew up in Florida and he's he's not a fan of like super hot humid weather. So he wants to you know st stay away from that probably but uh, understandable. I don't want to I don't want to say no cuz I mean Hawaii is beautiful so I can't. I know. It it's, it sounds like so ideal. So I I don't know. I would, I'd be down to do it. Right. So, so you are moving back there uh, next year. That's the plan as of right we're now? We're planning August. Yeah. Okay. Whether, cool. whether my partner likes it or not, we're going. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like, you know, cause you give and take in a relationship and that's just something that has to be yeah. done. Yeah. He's yeah. He's just going to take whatever, whatever I want to do. That's yeah. What's gonna happen. He'll like it. He'll, he'll yeah. learn to like it. Yeah. I'll learn to like it. He better. Yeah. Um, when, when did music kind of enter your life? Was it at a younger age or kind of in your teen years that you started getting into it? When, when did that come about for you? It was, uh, I, I have a, I have four older siblings. So my oldest brother is 11 years older. And then my sister's like, uh, just over eight years older than me. And they were both pretty into, uh, music. So I, I was just around, they, you know, they were like into whatever was popular. My sister went pretty deep into like new wave and goth and stuff like that too. So I always had a good, uh, sorry, there's a chopper flying overhead, but. I, I don't like, know what you did before this, Brian, but um, legally yeah. you were here at 148. I can attest to that. That is, that's, I, and I will say that. Yeah. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm going to say no more on that, on that yeah. subject. That's, yeah. <laughs> moving but forward I, yeah establishing my, um, the alibi yeah yeah and i was i was here we clearly i don't have a clock in the background that could um you know back right that I'm, up. I'm 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 verifying it for you yeah as a, uh, and this is recorded and yeah perfect. yeah we're all we're all good <laughs> but uh yeah no i just i um i just grew up around around my older siblings their influences and then my mom's actually a musician so I grew up around it. <clears throat> she mostly would do singing. She plays piano and a few other instruments, but she was, you know, like active in the church choir and stuff. So I grew up around music and had instruments in the house to play with. So it was kind of Deal. just like built in. Yeah. When did a uh, drumming kind of enter your life? When did, you, when, when were you kind of gravitated towards percussion? That was uh, when I was, when I moved back to San Diego, <clears throat> when I was like 10, and uh, I was in a new school and had all new, had to make all new friends. And this kid, his name is James. And uh, he, he and his brother were really into metal and like, um, and then like whatever was happening at the time, like Nirvana just had come out with Nevermind. And so he was like obsessed with drums and we were, I was like, oh, this is my new friend. And I kind of like fell into getting obsessed with it too. And we both wound up being 
drummers like later on but yeah that was he was probably like the biggest influence um for that just I never really considered doing it before that I just appreciated music but it wasn't like something I was obsessed with yet it kind of that came a little later but but yeah drums just looked like fun so I don't know I, I remember seeing like Nirvana on Saturday Night Live and seeing uh, Dave Grohl looked insane just like this ball of hair moving around and then they smashed all their stuff that was cool but yeah I was into that and then I was into like Motley Crue and stuff like that so all the flashy drummers like that were pretty inspiring too all the low-key kind of just just hanging back there kind of dude yeah just really subtle people like tommy lee who you know he's definitely not showboating or anything ever it, infamously just under the radar kind of guy absolutely yeah really yeah just a mellow dude i honestly haven't even heard that name in, in quite a while i don't even know i don't even know what he did post yeah, his career yeah i don't yeah i don't know Gone the world on, hasn't heard from him Right. It's it's one of those people that you're like, wow, well, yeah, what happened to them? You know, what happened to that guy? <laughs> yeah, just faded into obscurity somewhere in the 80s. I don't know. Didn't yeah. definitely didn't have any controversy or anything. No. Just, no. Just kind of faded out. Yeah. Just clean living, you know. Yeah, which is which is the, the great way to do it. You know, don't don't get messed up in all that other stuff. Just kind of do your thing and when your time's up, just kinda just kinda bail from the limelight. Yeah. Yeah. Just I think yeah. I should reach out to him and see if see if he'd be down to, to come on the podcast. I bet he has some stories. Yeah, I'll, I'll, he's probably got a couple stories. I don't know. It seems like seems I like mean, it, forever ago though, so I mean, it might be hard to you know remember because he's track him down. normal life and everything. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I'll, I'll look into that. Um, so, kind of flashing forward a little, a little bit um, within drumming, when did you? begin to join your first band when, when did you start like playing with other people oh that was uh like my freshman year of high school that was the first time I met people that were kind of in my circle of immediate friends or like new kids I met <clears throat> from high school that were playing instruments that actually wanted to do more than like just fuck around a little bit and then not you know pursue it further like I met a kid named Jim Kelly and he he was writing his own songs and stuff and so I lucked out I was like oh that's a that's a way in so I could play with somebody and he's already written all these songs and stuff so he's he's already like way more advanced than anyone I had known up to that point so yeah just freshman year of high school I had a, a band with a couple of guys and we were like a funk band really really into the red hot chili peppers <laughs> oh good deal but like we were, into, we were into like we were into like actual uh like 70s funk too we were into like george clinton and and stuff like that but but we, we would do covers of like you know whatever was on the radio at the time like weezer and green day and you know any anything on the radio like alternative radio so we were just learning how to just do it together but yeah i, I was lucky i met people that knew how to play and they had both taken lessons and I like found a way in. I like didn't know how to play drums, but I kind of messed around until it started sounding decent. And my parents were really cool. They let me learn how to play drums in the house, which is insane that they let me do that because it's the worst instrument in the world to like let your kid learn how to play probably. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it's gonna sound bad for a long time before it starts sounding good. Yeah, there's like no melody involved at all. It's just no. crashing and it's a horrible, like my parents, God bless them, you know, but. Yes, yeah. mine as well. I appreciate you, mom and dad. Thank you. Play, you. Do, you play a, do you play an instrument? Yes, or? I do. I, I do. I got the drums behind me. You can't really see them there. Oh, but man. Yeah. Okay. So you know, like, you know exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, Green Day, <laughs> Blink-182, Weezer, you know, that, that kind of. The, the staples, yeah. The staples of funk music, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. The building blocks of soul and funk. Yeah. Absolutely. Everything can be traced back to them. Mm -hmm. and what kind of I know I hate to do this, but what kind of what kind of drums do you have? I got a pair of pearls. Road nice. shows. Yeah. Ooh, I nice. love them. Very, very nice. Yeah. Are you do you play with uh anybody at the moment? Are you much much like your early days, nothing ever came to fruition. So 
you know, you always had those buddies. Oh, let's jam. Let's do it. And then, you know, it just kind of loses steam. Actually, recently I did play with a good buddy of mine, Andrew, um, love him. And he was like, let's, let's play. I said, yeah. So you got the guitar. It was very nice. I hadn't played with anybody in a while. I'll just usually kind of just, you know, keep up to date. Like, oh, I like that song. Let me, let me learn how to play that song and such as, as you know, how that goes. And yeah. uh, it was just very nice to have another person. In. And, you know, and obviously you always get better when you're playing with other people and just people in general. So totally. Yeah. It's yeah. Like you have to do it or else, I don't know, you could, you could technically get better as a drummer, especially and like, be one of these kids that can just rip like on the internet that you see. And I'm like, I could never do that, but right. I don't know. I was, I was kind of wanted to be part of like a band and play with people. Cause it's kind of lonely to like jam on your drums yourself. It's super fun and therapeutic, but yeah, I don't know. I kind of always needed like the hangout too. With people. Right. The hang is very crucial and it's very nice. And especially when you're bonding over something that is a shared interest like music. Yeah, And it doesn't matter who, even if you do play music or you don't play music, um, everybody likes music to some extent. So like, that's always, I feel like that's super like common ground. You could find somebody like, you know, you like George Clinton. I like George Clinton, you know, like something like that. Just yeah. super, super important. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's always fun. <clears throat> I don't know if you, if you ever play with people, but uh, yeah, it is very, I highly recommend it, Brian. I was thinking about starting, yeah starting a new funk band yeah like, oh hey that's <laughs> that's a good idea there dave and i were talking about it recently actually so we we just have to figure it out it's not he dave has a funk band do you know about dave's dave's band fun country yes i i, I actually do yeah they they released uh, I, I remember seeing that um uh, maybe a little bit ago now but yes I, I i do remember seeing that yeah it's i mean i love it every once in a while i get to um to play with them but they have kind of have a different lineup uh, whenever they're doing shows, depends on who's available to play. So it's super fun. And I love, I mean, anytime I get to play with any of those guys now is, is great. But That's amazing. Got to get Dave on. Got to get Dave on. Yeah. And then uh, eventually this is a kind of a hidden agenda that I will share to you, Brian, but don't let this slip to anybody else. I'm going to try to get everybody back together from the soft pack. Have them, have them perform. And uh right that would be amazing um maybe i'll have letterman like host it that'd be good i think because you guys have a good rapport yeah. and you know I don't and think he's too busy anymore he's, he's no <laughs> no another guy just kind of just just kind of just kind of faded out you know yeah I don't, maybe maybe he knows tommy lee i don't know maybe mm -hmm. they're hanging out they might run in the same circles i don't know but yeah i could i could definitely see that happening yeah i mean if you can make this happen jacob i'm I'm down. I'll I'll go on record right now and say I will do it. Okay, you know? and and I'm I'm glad that you mentioned a record because we are gonna we're gonna we're gonna put down a new one. So good. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Tours, everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, speaking of the soft pack, though, when did you begin that kind of um point in your life that you entered that band? When that was after high school, I'm assuming. Yeah, I was um. I was out of college by the time I met uh, Matt Lampkin and Maddie, and I was already like touring in some punk and hardcore bands before that. And uh, the singer of a couple of the bands I played in, um, Brandon, he's now he is the singer of that band Crocodiles, but he was um, roommates with Matt Lampkin and uh, oh, Maddie wow. would come over. And they'd have house parties. They used to house. They used to have house parties like all the time. And uh, Maddie would be in town from. I think he was visiting from college, or maybe he would just come down from North County, San Diego, and like hang out. And he uh, through through that like living situation. Um, that's how I met Matt Lampkin, and we hit it off. And I don't know. And then Maddie, we hit it off because Maddie's just like. Maddie's super fun and hilarious and and then I met David through through those guys and yeah they all had they all went to high school together too those three went to high school so they introduced me to a huge group of friends that I didn't have before so it's through them I met lots and lots of uh of other people but That's it was after awesome. college 
yeah, it was after college for me. And I think Maddie maybe just finished college. And I think Matt was wrapping up his um, film school time at UCSD. And uh, yeah, they, they were playing as a band for, I think like, they're playing probably around sometime, uh, maybe a, it had been about a year and they had had a bunch of lineup changes. Um, and then I, I kind of wasn't, I had stopped doing music for a couple of months and I thought I was gonna just, I had a job and I was like, I'm gonna just work in this office <laughs> and like do that. And uh, there were only a couple bands I would have played with at the time because I was kind of, I had been touring and all that for years and I just kind of wanted to, you know, like mellow out and, uh, but the, they, they asked me to play and I was like, okay, I'll play with those guys because I really loved their band and I thought they had great songs and uh, I don't know, we had a good time together. So luckily, yeah, luckily they asked me to, to play, but it was at a time where I was like, I was like semi-retired. I, I wasn't planning on playing with anybody anymore. Wow. But I just liked, I just liked their songs. I remember they gave me their like, CD to learn the songs and there was a bunch that I hadn't heard yet and I thought they were great so I would go see them and it was kind of universal but amongst all my friends we all were like okay that's they were one of our favorite bands playing at the time it was them and this band the sesh which were like the sesh we all kind of said were like the best band in town at the time and I they totally were they were great so I mean what a great but name too. The Sesh. Was yeah, the Sesh. They were oh. they were fun. They got they have records out. I they must they must be around on like the on Spotify or something. I hope they are. I hope those records are still available somehow. But that's 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 just a strong, strong name. Yeah. I like yeah. it. Yeah. Strong, strong sound too. Those guys were they were great. It it, it invokes a to Matt Lampkin's solo record to uh, Andrew, the drummer of the Sesh, like I think he produced and he plays on a few of those songs like the drum tracks or that's him so, wow that's awesome ripper yeah that's 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 really cool that 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 uh the community it seemed like was was going hand in hand with with one another and whatever was going on everybody knew about or was a fan of what was going on within that time frame yeah it was t it was like tight knit and then it's weird how many of those people kind of grew up together and i wasn't part of that circle of those friends but um through getting involved with maddie and matt and dave like i yeah made so many so many friends through those guys so it's it's yeah it's cool it's a nice it was a nice like little little scene down there at the time i don't know what's going like i'm i'm sadly i'm a little ignorant about what the current scene is down there i'm sure it's good there's always good music down there but i don't really know like what's happening there's always some, some strong stuff coming out of san diego but more importantly you'll be really tapped into what's going on in hawaii coming this oh. this august i believe right yeah. so i mean that'll start be something up yeah yeah <laughs> going back a little bit that 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 time that you kind of thought that you were taking a break or at least leaving uh uh touring and in and, and playing in bands for a bit if that opportunity hadn't come about to join the soft pack at that time, do you think that you would eventually made your way back to music? I actually, before, before playing with those guys, I had started playing in another band. It was called wild weekend. And it was, uh, it was like an all female band that did covers of, uh, there's a legendary San Diego punk band called the zeros. And they, they started as an all female, like zeros cover band. And, uh, then the drummer, she, left i think the drummer and bass player yeah the drummer and bass player left they were in another band called the adams which was another like really great band at that time and uh they left and then my friend kelly was she was one of the guitarists and singers in that band she's like hey would you want to play drums and it just sounded like fun so i did that and it was super fun it was like just i don't know it was different to just play shows just for fun again and you know like also being in like primarily playing with women in a band was the first for me and it was super cool it was great I loved it it was I don't know that's a awesome. different different thing but 
it was through that that like I think maybe Matt and Maddie saw I was doing that and they're like, oh, I guess he's playing again. So maybe we could ask him. So yeah, they yeah, they had they had a few other drummers before and people just couldn't like make certain shows. They book shows and then they're they were people that were in other bands and stuff and they'd be like, oh, I got a show that night with my other band. And so Matt and Maddie wanted to just push forward and eventually I had I left the other I left Wild Weekend and uh, started playing with with those guys. When you first kind of jammed with them, like the the very first session, if you could remember what 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 that was like with them and kind of just hanging out, did you feel immediately like, okay, this is this is something awesome that I want to be a part of? Yeah, it was. I already knew that um, I was familiar enough with like their music before, so and I had seen them play um, at least a few times and I was like no this band is great and I knew I knew them well enough to know that they were a fun hang and the first time we played it was like right after Christmas 2007 or so and we were at Maddie's mom's house because Maddie's Maddie's brother Trevor had a drum kit there and like they would rehearse there and um so I went up there and uh we played and I just remember everybody, it seemed like really exciting. I don't know, it sounded, it sounded really good. And then it felt good to like play and like really lay into the songs. And I don't know, like I was familiar enough with them and I think we would do like, after a song or two, I think Maddie was like super stoked, like visibly stoked. And that always makes me feel good. It's like, oh, cool. I guess it sounds good. But When did you kind of um, figure out that you wanted to play a, a cocktail kit? Uh, uh, for for the drums when when did that kind of come about I had uh I bought one for fun just to kind of learn how to play them because I always thought they were cool looking um before I started playing with those guys and then I'd say like any decision to make that my primary kit was born out of extreme laziness like I just didn't want to move a bunch of shit around anymore so it was really like making it compact and easy. Like I just wanted something that when you're done playing and you have to clear the stage, it's kind of a bummer. Um, if you can just pick up the whole thing and like walk off stage, it's, it's awesome. And then every sound guy will love that part about it, but they hate um, figuring out how to mic the thing. Is the, that was the only issue, but. Um, yeah, I could see how that would be, that'd be difficult. Um, it just, it just looks weird. They're like, where's the kick drum? And you know, where, how do, do I cut a hole in the bottom of this? You're like, no, dude, like don't, please don't. And, but yeah, I was like, the reason I did it was, I just, I thought it was, I thought it was cool. And then like, I was into, um, you can see uh, in the movie, there's something about Mary. Um, what's his name? Uh, Tommy Larkins. Tom, yeah, Tommy Larkins plays one. That was the first time I saw one, uh, like on, in a movie or like anywhere. And um, then I was like, oh man, I want to like, learn how to play that thing that looks insane and then like there are a couple other stand-up drummers that were pretty prominent like the um the guy from violent femmes mm -hmm. um so i just i liked i liked kind of like it made them stand out to me too they were they were like interesting these weird little contraptions i thought they were cool right but yeah but it was like uh, mostly laziness to answer your question yeah that's awesome. Uh, speaking of Tommy Larkins, I went to go see Jonathan Richmond uh, a few weeks ago now um, nice. at uh, the Zebulon, and I was standing uh, right next to his kit, and I got a good look at it. It's very like an odd setup, but I I love it. It's like not traditional at all. I'll send you a picture of it. It looks oh, dude, I was loved. Yeah, I have, I saw him, I saw him years ago too, and I stood also by like right by the kit because I was just like, what's he playing? And it was like right. bongos and stuff. It's just. He's super cool. He's like one of those guys I, I forget about sometimes how just how cool his style is. And then I'm reminded either they're playing in town and like people are talking about it. And I'm like, oh yeah, that drummer is amazing. And he's his volume too. He's like the best at controlling volume and just playing perfectly for Jonathan Richmond. It's just, I don't Definitely. know. The two of them together are just so so good I don't know. yeah really really good and i mean of course um and not to get too inside baseball with this 
but yeah. Jonathan Richardson when he plays live, it's kind of it's kind of like a little bit softer and it gets a little bit higher in places. And Tommy just knows when to kind of bring it back and kind of take a step back and be a little bit more forward when he's kind of dancing and it's just relying on the kit. Alone. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Super super yeah, cool stuff. He's great, yeah. and he's he's it seems like he's always playing, and I I gotta go see him more because I don't think he ever plays like a, a bad set. So. I've I, I've never seen a bad set from him. I've seen it a couple times now. It's amazing. Yeah, it's the best. Good, good stuff. And then you you listen to him talk. He's like, yeah. And Lou Reed taught me how to play like guitar. It's like oh, fucking. This is like a living legend right now. You know. That's absolutely like he's he's just one of those dudes that he's a yeah he's a legend. There's no no better word for that. He's just one of the dudes. That's it. One of the dudes. Yeah. And then like his history with Modern Lovers and. I mean, those records still sound exciting and cool. Those are those were like really inspirational records for Matt and Maddie when they were starting their band. So like, we all got we all had these like um, common bands that we liked. Um, those guys were really into the fall, and they were really into like Jonathan Richmond stuff like that. So we had um, Maddie and I bonded over the replacements and. You know, we just like we clicked on that level as friends before we started playing together. So it was it was pretty nice to be asked to like play with them. I kind of knew what I wanted to do with them when I got to play with them. So it was it was it was a good fit, I think. That's awesome. Going back to the cocktail kit, was it yeah. kind of different for you to um to be standing instead of sitting? Was that like a like a, a, a not an issue but kind of a thing that you had to wrap your head around like okay i'm gonna be standing for this whole set playing this it was, kid yeah it was uh it started out totally fine and then like over time it did start kind of wearing my knees out a little bit so i balance all my i balance all my weight on my left leg and then like use the the right leg to do the kick and like it was weird. I tried to let it hover as much as possible and have it be really light on that kick. And so I could just like lean into it. And uh, over time it kind of did mess with my back and my knees a little bit. So I had to, I had to go back to just a, like an, a traditional kind of setup. But I think I also wanted to just have a little more, some more options. I like the, the sparse setup a lot, but it's cool to add in a couple of extra little doohickeys like hi hats and i don't know like for years i just didn't have hi hats and that was kind of like cool. oh, that's extra for you limited that's, that's extra yeah i had this cool thing of a hi hat do you remember the first song that you contributed to for the soft pack do you do, do you recall the first thing that you guys kind of jammed on it's like hey can you help out with writing this um the song maybe like in an arrangement way I can think of like um, parasites. Maybe there was there's like a part in it where uh, there's like a like it gets really heavy for for a couple of seconds there, and I think just you know like oh we should do that only one time instead of twice or you know it was probably like minor things like that. Um, but I don't remember exactly. I think actually the song Mexico we Matt had chords and then like dave i don't know i don't know if that baseline if, if dave just came up with that baseline i can't remember exactly who came up with what there but we jammed that one and it was just like uh that one kind of felt nice right off the bat but it wasn't a song until later but like the matt had those chords and yeah i don't know i just remember jamming that i think that might have been the first thing that they hadn't fully written that was like we jammed on if i recall correctly but i know that's great um now to, to, to even delve deeper within this the soft yeah. pack um i saw this video and and uh and to to refresh your it was down on lovin and it was performed live on a beach and i don't remember what beach it was do you do, do you recall that kind of thing it's it's up on youtube and i'll link it below great yeah. kind of live version of that song down love it do, do you remember uh, recording that yeah i remember we went to 
I can't remember the name of the beach. Like those guys would totally remember because it, it was such a, I think it was a good like surf spot and it wasn't, oh man, I forget the name of that place. But they were, the reason we went down there is there were, for some reason, there was like a storm and there were these huge swells and they wanted to get that in the background. And those guys were like, at least Dave and Matt um, were into surfing and boogie boarding and stuff. So they like, they knew that spot. And um, our friend Felipe filmed that. He did a lot, he filmed a lot of like those, uh, those first few videos, um, but yeah, I remember we went to the beach and we went, just did a couple of takes of that. And there's in that, there's like a guitar case, I think on the sand and that has the microphone to pick up any of the live sounds. So that was the only mic. I think we just used the one little mic hidden in the guitar case. Yeah, I was it. wondering about like that, picking that up. Like it, 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 and it sounds great. And it's, you know, of course it's a great visual it's down there on the beach. Can't get any better than that. And I, I was wondering, like, how is that all? Pick? Is it the camera itself? Is it like a mic, like a nice mic on it? I was. Very, it was very probably a nice that. mic that, yeah. One of our friends, either Felipe or um, I think maybe our friend Russ was involved in that one too. I can't remember who all was there. Our friend Andrew, maybe they all had like, cause they would do film stuff and music stuff and they all had like good gear. So we would, you know, working with your friends that had cool mics that you could, you know, hide in a guitar case that would pick up decent sound and then have someone mix it. I think it was probably mixed after the fact too. Because yeah, otherwise it was, it was really loud. I remember those waves were pretty loud. And then I think there must have been one or two takes we did where people like walked in front of the camera, I'm sure, which I don't know, which is, that's always fun to like keep stuff like that, but I don't know. Right. I don't, it, I don't know. It, it didn't take real. too long. Yeah. We just, it was just like, a, it was literally like going down to the beach and hanging out for a few hours and then, and then going home. But it was, it was fun. I think we might've tried it in a different location too. I don't, I don't know. I don't remember. I thought we did it on the rocks. Maybe we just took photos or something on the rocks. I can't remember. Either way, good day at the beach. Productive. Yeah. It's always a day at the beach with those guys. It's so fun. Um, now you you were playing even more. You're just a uh, snare in. What was the, what was the other thing that that you had um, at your disposal on that? I think line? I tried to work in a tambourine. I think it wasn't a very good choice. I think I should, I, like I, in retrospect, I, I shouldn't just snare. To, you know what? The people can be. I'm trying to get uh, fancy. The, the the people can be the judges of that. Uh, please comment below if Brian did a good job. <laughs> I believe so. Brian doesn't think so. I don't know. Great. Well, you're very kind. Thank you. Thank you for making that video. I, I really like it. Um, and so it, it always kind of seemed like like you're working differently within that band um, th throughout its its entirety, and I think that really had an effect on the sound that was created through through those those songs and how you play. Yeah, that I mean, it was at least for me to like limit kind of what I was doing and limit the amount of symbols and stuff was helpful. I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know for like presenting those songs. Yeah, um, I still I still played way too hard. Now, like I look back, I'm like, dude, I'm like smashing that. No, I don't know. Should like lay off the fucking ride a little bit, old Brian. But I don't know. Things we'll, you learn later. Like, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get in touch with them later on, and we'll we'll <laughs> too loud. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's uh. That's that's very interesting that, that you kind of incorporated those kind of different ideas within that band. Uh, moving forward, I mean, yeah, uh, going into the future of other projects that you did post uh, the soft pack, did that help influence what you were doing? Even uh, on the tail end of the soft pack with playing just like with a regular kit, did did that kind of working in that sort of um, box, if you will? kind of ex expand your mind when you did get to have a hi-hat like you said and you're like oh like, it's nice playing with this did that create like a, a broader scope of horizon in terms of creation with music yeah i mean i had the other bands i had done before uh soft pack where i played like more traditional setup like a four-piece kit and so i was used to it but it was it, it was nice to take a break from um that and yeah, coming back to having like a full drum kit kind of, it felt good. It felt like I wasn't bored with it. That was another thing. It was like laziness and boredom made me do the cocktail kit. 
And then I got bored of that. And then also my knees hurt really bad. But so I like going back and uh, doing it like a traditional, it, it just felt like it felt right. It was kind of like getting back on a bike or something. It was, you know, it was a good, it was, it was time to like switch it up. Yeah. So it totally was, was helpful. What was the first album that you were a part of? The first where I'm on the entire one is that self-titled record but the muslims record before I, i'm on four of those songs um and they they had the other ones were already recorded with different uh, musicians i think dave also is just on those four he might he might have been on he might have been on some of those other early ones but dave joined the band maybe two months before i did too so he was he was like a newer member when I joined too but yeah that, that self-titled the one uh where we're on the on the beach again with the beach oh you guys are at guys. the beach that's it gets kind yeah. of a different change of pace for you guys. Oh, okay yeah yeah I don't, so, I don't really think about that yeah, those guys, I mean they grew up they grew up in like near uh Del Mar or like in Del Mar so mm -hmm. those guys like the beach and I'm and really where, pale, so I gotta you know I gotta put on sunblock when I'm doing that so you can see I'm always wearing a hat and I look like I'm semi like annoyed to be at the beach. Sunblock is important for anybody with any skin. Yeah, it's true. Come on, Brian, give the give the give that PSA about the about the skin care. It's important. Again, it's a, you were you were right on your stance on art being a good thing, and uh, sunblock is good. Yeah, I'm just I'm just a contrarian, I guess you know. But I'm, I I got I got I got push this. Yeah, speak uh, your truth. In in relation to, to San Diego now, where where did where were you growing up? You said it was not kind of near the beach. What kind of uh, what part of it were you? Oh, I, I wasn't living? too far, um, but I grew up in an area called uh, Claremont, which is just like a suburb. If you're familiar with San Diego, it's like if you're going on the five south, it would be below. It's kind of like just east of like La Jolla, but La Jolla is over this hill on the other side of the uh, five. So I'm like in a suburb that was like just just east of that, which was like not an exciting, there's not a lot happening in Claremont. It's, it's you know, it's like just a suburb, but it's Claremont. It's good. I, it's I like it. Yeah. There's a great coffee shop, Claremont Coffee there. Is there? Highly recommend it. Very good coffee. Really? Mm -hmm. Wait, do you know, you know, Claremont, like in San Diego? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, no way. Yeah, it's over I grew there. Up, yeah. North Claremont is where I'm from. So if you're, I don't know, they call it like it's part of the Golden Triangle. This is going. This is some inside baseball, San Diego. We're stuff. really getting into <laughs> really specific here. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. inside Padres right now. Yeah. Coffee, really? Yeah, okay. Claremont Coffee. Yes, sir. I'll. I'll Let me know. Too. Like, send me a drop a pin, and I'll. Next time I'm in in San Diego, I'll have to. Have to Bingo. Pin. Exactly. Yeah. We're going to go, we're going to go film it, me and you, Brian, and you're going to show me where you used to hang out and play music. We're going to go down to Claremont, get some coffee. That's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. I'm down. Four hour video of you. Oh yeah. And oh, yeah. I, I parked here one time. I got a parking ticket. Wasn't very nice. On to the next spot. Stuff like that. Oh yeah. The Claremont cops, man. I don't know. Parking tickets, jaywalking. No, don't do it. Did you, did you, did you ever get a ticket for jaywalking? No, and I'm like, I'm afraid to get a ticket for jaywalking. I'm the guy that will um, sit and wait till the light changes. I'm that guy that people are jaywalking. And like in New York, I won't do that, but like I'll do it here. But I guess now you can't get um, ticketed for that unless you're putting yourself in imminent danger because the law just changed. And it, that should be the law, okay? If there's no other cars coming, it's, I've, yeah, I, I, I fully endorse it. If there's nobody, if it's a blank street in the, whatever crosswalk is like whatever three blocks away from you or whatever it is like who's got time to yeah. do that not us not we're us right we're that. busy yeah we're busy guys <laughs> um going back to the to the album that you were just speaking of the self-titled soft pack album what was was that recording uh process like for you being being in there and, and contributing to these songs that was that was a crazy time. Um, 
we we finished the writing on that record. We wrote it pretty quickly um, because we were playing a lot of shows at the time and we we had a manager at the time also who, I don't know, we kind of we had fallen into having like a team at that point. So we were doing a lot of press and like a lot, which was crazy to me because I had only been in like hardcore bands and punk bands that, you know, like, you get 20 kids at the show and you were like, this is rad. And, you know, you, you talked to like kids that had zines and that was totally rad, but this was like a whole different experience. So there was a lot of pressure on that record, but we did it really quickly because it was all written and we kind of had worked those songs out on tour. Um, and I think we tracked everything super fast. Like we were living in New York to do it for a few weeks and we were just going to the studio every day. And wow. it was this really great studio. We wanted to do it there and with this producer because he worked on the Obits record. And we met him and his name's Eli Janney. And he's uh, now he's in the 8G band on the Seth Meyers uh, show. He's the keyboard player, but yeah. he's um, he's he's great. And then he he was also, actually he and his older brother were like in, some discord records bands that I loved. So I was like, even meeting him when we were kind of scoping out who was gonna produce the record, it was it was thrilling for me. Cause I was like, oh dude, he was in um, Girls Against Boys and he was in, uh, God, what is the name of the other? I'm, I'm blanking on the the band before that, that turned into Girls Against Boys. But... Minor Threat, yeah, got it. Yeah, <laughs> no, but his, his brother was in, uh, his brother, I think his brother's in Rites of Spring. Oh, wow, okay. I mean, I was just like, dude, because I was like a massive Discord, still am like a massive fan of all that stuff. It was really influential, but but recording with him was great, and he was he was super fun, and it was easy. And I remember he was really happy that it was getting tracked so quickly. We just kind of, I don't know, we like got through it super fast. It was it was fun. It was like a really crazy weird time because I was I don't know there was just so much like press and stuff was was that um did you guys feel like you we were all on the same page like moving as a unit within the band yeah we for, i'd say for the most part we definitely had disagreements about stuff like you do with any collaborative thing you're working on with with people um or like you know whether or not this song should be on the record. You know, I remember after we kind of like turned it in, kind of like second guessing, just like normal stuff. I'm sure every band, like when you, you feel all that pressure to like deliver because you had some hype before and you're trying to like keep it going. But um, I'd say like I, out of everybody, I probably had the least amount of pressure on me because I, I wasn't singing or, you know, like I just felt like I was in the back, you know? So, yeah. The only pressure you were feeling was within your knee and that was building up. That wasn't, yeah. Massive pressure. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. massive pressure, my knee and, and my uh, mid back. Probably. So, yeah, but it was, it was cool. That recording, um, I think it still sounds great. Like, I don't know, Eli was super fun to work with and yeah, I don't know. I, I like that record still. My mom likes that record too. So if your mom likes the record, then it's a good Probably. record. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Well, your mom should like everything you do, right? Mm -hmm. Also, it's nice if they're like, I, that wasn't my favorite one. That's also good to hear. It's like, okay, you're not just saying this just because I'm your child, which yeah. is always nice. Oh, she told me the next one she didn't like as much. Okay, see, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, that's that. why I'm like, okay, mom, mom's, being, mom's being real. So like, yeah. yeah. As a musician, you know, you got to, yeah. She, she has her own opinion. She's entitled to it. Yeah. My mom writes for Pitchfork, actually. She gave it a 2.1. Oh, okay. So I was like, okay, mom, whatever. See you at Christmas. I don't know. There, there, it, there is going to be that, like, oh, yeah, my my mother does write for Pitchfork, and then people will have to, like, oh, well, why did your mom give me this score? That's going to be a real point of contention. Yeah, do they have the same stranglehold that they had on music for like forever? Do they still have it? Do you think? 
Remember that though, when like everything had to, you they had to get you had to get the blessing. But it was it was a big thing. It was a big <laughs> big part of it. I think that it's. I think people are still aware of it. I just don't think it has the zhuzh that it did um, back in you know 2011, 2012. These kind of pivotal years that like people were really make or break on it. reviews. Yeah, where you're like, fuck, just give us a six, <laughs> like nothing lower than yeah. Right. Um, do you, did you uh, end up kind of paying attention to to reviewers? Does that does it have any effect or bearing on you, or do you do you notice it? And you're like, okay, and then you just kind of move on. I I tried not to dwell on it too much, but it was. Yeah, you definitely would read those things and get bummed if they weren't good, you know, or if they were really good, you'd be you'd feel great, you know. But but then you after you know after a while you can't worry too much about that stuff it's just it's it's, as long as people actually like the band and you're happy doing it you know and you're proud of the records you're doing and you you like know they're good maybe like the person reviewing it it just wasn't their thing you know i don't know but totally cool i just don't i don't really read record reviews anymore um for like a while i haven't i just if i hear something that i like or if Usually I just get recommendations of something that's good from somebody that I trust. From your time living in LA, have you seen anybody that you're like, oh, there's a such and such or there's so and so? Oh yeah, yeah. I I'm also like I'm I really am terrible at uh realizing who it is. Um I'm one of those people that like they can walk right by me, I won't know. Hmm. And uh until someone points it out. But um God, have I seen? I don't know. I can't even think offhand. Like maybe like one of the most famous people I've, I've seen uh, before I lived in LA. I saw um, Justin Timberlake, and when he was dating Cameron Diaz, big, big my name. friends and my old band, uh, we were like drunk, and we were at Astro Burger on Santa Monica, and they came in, and like there was a weird. It was super weird. Um, I don't know, we had a weird interaction with them where my friend, the singer of my band uh, was insulting <laughs> to them. And like Justin Timberlake was shouting at him across the, uh, across Jastro Burger. And we were just like, this is the weirdest thing. And none of us lived in LA yet. And we were like, this is the weirdest place. So yeah. that was, that was a good uh, celebrity experience. But I don't know, I see people once in a while, but I don't know. I probably think of them later on, but I, I just don't think about it too much. But you're just like you're like, excuse me, sir. You're just like signing by, and it's like Paul McCartney. You're like, I I don't care. I gotta. You could, you could tell, I would be the guy that does that. Yeah, I, I remember I, because you have stuff to do. You you can't be dwelling on who you're passing by. It's like I just, I, yeah, and I don't like staring at people either. I don't like should be like I know that person, and like I don't feel comfortable doing it. I'm really pretty like introverted mostly, and um, I don't know. I also don't want to like bug people. I feel like I'm bugging somebody if I like go up to them. Right. I've been at festivals and like seen people I would love to have said hi to. And I'm like, I'm too chicken shit to say hi to this person, but they're right here. And, like, and they seem cool. They seem nice. I don't know. Like Justin Timberlake like an Astro Burger. Yes. Yeah. Like Even though he's yelling at you, are like, that's a nice, you're a nice guy. He came up and apologized later and he totally, I, I will fully say we like our group of, we were in the wrong. He he was he was like, I am a celebrity. I need to do this, and I don't want to, but I'm going to. And he was very like polite and um saw his I saw his skin in person. It was the smoothest skin I have ever seen on a human. It was it was amazing. It seems like he would have some smooth skin just from an outside perspective. Super smooth. Him- That's all I could remember is the smoothest skin I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. It was <laughs> his face. Yeah, he just I mean. He's a very handsome in person. Good as deal. as and I, that's probably controversial to say. I know not a popular opinion that he's a good looking guy, but you know. no. But I, I, again, I'm glad that we're kind of airing this stuff out because I mean, and it's it's such a turbulent time. People don't want to hear these things. It's like, well, you know, yeah. we, we got to face reality at some point. Got to get real. Yeah. Also, and I I, I know you're not going to believe me on this. Smooth skin. Tommy Lee. No way. Just gonna. I just. I, 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 I believe you. He's okay. a young. He he's got like an eternal youth kind of vibe to him. He sure I does. Know. I can see it. 
I love how much we're talking about Tommy Lee. It's good. It's good. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. I feel. I feel like um, if I was a good um, podcaster, I'd be like, uh, and Tommy Lee, and then I'd just bring him in. He's like, oh, what's up? We could just edit it. Yeah. Just yeah. It. You yeah, can just... grab him from someone else's podcast and move him in. Splice it. Yeah. Yeah. Do whatever professional. Have your your producer and your uh, your yeah, team we... behind you have him work on that. Can we? Can we get him in here? Okay. We're we're working on it. We're working on it. Cool. In the meantime. Brian, going back to the soft pack and yeah. that self-titled album. Yeah. What um what was your favorite? What is your favorite song off that album? If you if you if you had to 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 pick, whether it be for like playing or record the recording process or the writing process through, what what is the favorite off that album for you? It might be probably Mexico. I think that one just just sounds really nice. I remember putting all the like little piano bits on it and everything. it was it was fun to fun to like do all the overdubs on that one you know and then Maddie did that like insane like slide guitar that sounds just it just sounds like a I don't know it's, it's got all those sour notes that I really like in it I don't know it's it's a good one and my mom that's her favorite song too so gotta give it up for my mom you know there we go profound pitchfork writer it's like yeah yeah she knows which end is up in the music she's like this album's a zero but that song makes it a 2.1 pretty good <laughs> yeah got a bump up on it it's yeah pretty good uh now answer to yourself is on that album as well yes yeah that was the fun one to do of course that one was super fun that one was great did Recording you have a feeling that- that that was gonna be the one the a hit i didn't i didn't know that that would get um i didn't know that was yeah i didn't, I didn't know we, we were like pretty stoked on it um i think when it was recorded it felt more like okay that's clearly i think we had decided like that's probably going to be the first single um i think it was the first single come on might have been i don't remember exactly uh but i thought come on was gonna be like more of a i don't know it's like I would, you know if we were gonna i think that was a conversation too or when before we did letterman i i don't know if we knew it was gonna be that song i think that was a we figured it out at some point but it's also a great know. one no i mean it's, i i really i i like all those songs they kind of remind me of that time too which was really fun we just played music together every day and we're writing and hanging out afterward we spent so much time together and uh we did that for years it was it was great it was fun i moved up to la to like hang out and we all kind of lived not too far from one another so we i would see those guys every day it was great like i didn't do that before in bands i'd see my you know i had really good friends I played music with before that but it was like literally every single day we would hang out all day so that's awesome yeah so I just think about like that more than I don't I can't remember the specifics of uh the recording of some of that stuff but just like the vibe was fun mm-hmm. this is good sesh good sessions good sesh yeah absolutely yeah was that a pivotal point for you to move to LA it was really like long overdue and it was mostly to just get out of kind of like, I don't know, San Diego's beautiful and um, I just kind of wanted to like meet more people and like expand, you know, like my group of friends and I knew people that lived in LA already, some people from San Diego who made the, the trip up and I moved, the first place I lived, I had roommates who I'm like still friends with that were awesome. And mostly everybody was in music that I met anyway. And they just, everyone was cool. I don't know. But those guys had moved up before me. So they already knew and they were like trying to coax me up for like a while. And it didn't, I, like I was, I was just looking for an excuse to do it. Cause I, I had a job, but it wasn't a job I like necessarily wanted to stay at for like decades you know or anything like that it was just like oh this seems stable and it was fine and I had like 
definitely had friends and still have friends in San Diego, but it was like, it was just time for me to kind of check out like another city, I think. But, Claremont's yeah. beautiful. It has good coffee, but you got this other things. When I was there, they had bad coffee. So now, maybe now I wouldn't have left. I don't know. Maybe I, I would have stuck around a little longer. Maybe, maybe this is it. Maybe you, you leave LA, you go back to Claremont for a bit, and then obviously make the trek over to Hawaii. I'm not planning out your life. I'm just saying that's an opportunity. It's on the There's table. like way worse trajectory. You know, there's way worse uh, paths in life than that. Absolutely. What you just described. <laughs> it's like, if that's what you're doing, you're, you're probably okay. You know, it doesn't sound super action packed, but you know, that's okay. Sounds like a nice life. I don't know. Right, right. Maybe stop at Astro Burger on your way down. That's that's up. That's up to the person. It doesn't matter. If we're welcome back. I don't know. I don't JT know. would do it. If that's he's cool. there, I'm there. See how smooth his skin is these days. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, fucking mad, but <laughs> still, probably looks the same. Probably. Yeah, I think I think that guy's got good genes. I don't know. Mm-hmm. There's some yeah. th- there's some people that have just looked young forever. Jason Bateman, for example, that guy's oh totally been yeah fucking 27 forever. Ralph Macchio mm-hmm. he's, from he's, the Karate Kid. He looks the same. I think his hair is gray now, but he's the same guy. He's still the kid. Like, what are you gonna yeah. do? Yeah, <laughs> he could play himself again. Like, there you go. Going back to the answer to yourself um, song, because I, I I I'd asked maddie and matt this what was your reaction when you were um given the news that gta grand theft auto 5 wanted to use that song within the game oh yeah, yeah do you I mean, do you remember that brian that was it that was that happened i was <laughs> i do remember that the most um, popular video game to ever sell ever your song is on it how does that make you well, feel the connection was uh waves the connection was waves because those guys had a um they are the hosts steven and nate from waves are the hosts on vinewood like one of the stations so they i think they curated basically they told rockstar games guys they're like hey this is these are like this is a list of of bands you should check out and like put it on it so i mean People still do, I don't mention like that's how they first heard that song. And that's, I think that's rad because video game soundtracks were, they were like cool in the eighties, but they were, you know, like it's just a whole, it became this whole different thing. And it's, I don't know, you definitely get heard a lot by a lot more people. Um, something like that. I mean, that's a huge. It's millions and millions millions of people have heard that song now from the just from the game yeah i mean that's crazy yeah that because it was i don't know if it still is like the number one video i believe it is yeah because they keep on yeah. rejuging it it's been it's been I, like that yeah all their like expansion material and stuff but yeah waves it was because i think it was because of waves they like hooked it up and they hooked me up playing drums for them after so it's right was that, did you join that band when you moved to LA or was that still in San Diego that you were um, getting involved with that? With Waves? It was, uh, it was here in LA. They, um, everybody was living up here at that point. I knew, we all knew Nathan from San Diego. Because we, we would all be at the same parties. It was like a fairly small group of people like you'd see around at all the shows and all the all the house parties and stuff. So, so we knew him when he was doing other bands uh, before Wave, before he started that. And I think he started it after we had moved up or around this time we were like moving to LA. And that, I mean, his, that thing blew up super fast. Like he was, he got really popular like right away. So good band. To, yeah. To as yeah. well. Yeah. I think that's why, Brian. It was, it was it was it was a good band and people yeah. people took notice. Pitchfork I, gave him a solid review. It was it was that time, yeah. When I mean, I yeah. Once once you got that, ser- it was seriously like it was, it was like a stranglehold. It was like every band you'd wait for that review and you'd be like, 
I hope so. You know, if it's like not too bad, but no, I don't know. They were, I think we, our reviews were never like tens, you know, but they were, they were, they were like, they gave us like, okay. They're like, all right, you guys can make another album, maybe. <laughs> I just, I just don't agree with that scoring. That's just me. I'll start my own scoring system. Everybody yeah. gets tens all the time. There you Every, go. Everybody who comes on the podcast gets a ten. That's just. I like that. I like that. Because you're still limiting it. You're not. Right. You and I, I only have creme de la creme on here, so you know. <laughs> of course, easy. of course. I'm a fan, man. I'm a fan. I appreciate it, Brian. Um, when did you end up joining? waves when 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 did that kind of uh um, come to be the the soft pack was kind of winding down we put out our second record and we toured it and i think everybody kind of just we've been running pretty hard for a few years and we soft pack toured a lot and we wrote a lot. We still were like in the studio practicing every day and like recording and making demos. And But I think it just kind of hit a point where it was like time to kind of chill on it. Um, not everybody wanted to continue touring because uh, we had been doing it pretty, pretty consistently for a few years. And I think people needed to take a rest and like kind of at least like focus more on enjoying the songwriting process and without like trying to keep up with like a cycle that like this self-imposed kind of like we got to do this by this date and so I don't know it just kind of was it was like winding down in summer 2013 or like spring of 2013 so I was just kind of sitting around like I kind of want to keep touring I don't know what I'm going to do and I think that um the guys in waves noticed soft hack wasn't really playing a lot and they knew me and their drummer just quit so he uh they they had been touring a lot on the record i came in to do the end of the tour cycle and um i think he yeah he just he had his reasons but he's he like stepped out of the band and then um nate just texted me out of the blue one day and i was like yeah man because they, they had tours still to do to to finish up that touring cycle. And I was, you know, they uh, they had stuff that I wanted to do for sure. They're like, oh yeah. And then uh, I think Steven told me like a few weeks after I started playing with them, he's like, oh yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna do Conan. Or like we're supposed to do Conan. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, that sounds good. Like, yeah. And, so. and you, you said, I, I can't do that because obviously you're good friends with Letterman. That was kind of an issue, right? Yeah, well, if it had been Leno, I would have said absolutely not. But <laughs> no, I was well. Conan and Letterman, they were those guys. I think they love each other. But yeah, yeah, there's there's some admiration there for sure. Oh yeah, I but mean, Len, Leno. It would I'm be a comedy nerd. nerd. I was like, anytime that Conan was like my favorite. Anyway, but I don't know. So they were they were going to do that. They had already done Letterman, so I didn't get to do that with them. But that was with their previous drummer Jacob but um yeah later on we did uh we did Conan but but yeah it was just they needed they needed to, they had these tours booked they needed a drummer I wasn't playing so like it just lined up perfectly the timing was good good deal. it wasn't even like I necessarily stop back wasn't like broken up we just kind of we just kind of stopped playing and we like people moved Matt had already moved down to Mexico at that point so it was we were getting together less and less but it was like we're still we're still friends and everything we still talk like occasionally um i see dave more than anyone because he lives down the street but yeah awesome now brian if you were to do uh if you're to perform on a late night show like tomorrow or next week whatever really soon like yeah and and, and you had your your pick of who to play Who's whose late night show to play on? Who would you want to play on? What whose show? That's like a current mm -hmm. host on um, on the TV now. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I would take any of them honestly because it's such a it's like a fun, it's a weird thing to do, but it's so fun. But like 
Conan doesn't have a show anymore, but I like Conan's my he's my favorite. He's like he's, he's like my all-time favorite. But I would do like any of them, honestly. He's, they're all different. Um that's Seth Myers with Oh, with I would do that because I'm gonna I get to say hi to Eli. It's Eli's the man. All right, we'll, we'll they, they have the like guest drummers, you know, so they have like all the they have the guest drummers down there, but mm-hmm. red arm is I weasel my way into good. that. <laughs> But yeah, I did. Yeah, whatever. Any Monday, other. Fred Armisen. Oh uh, yeah, NBA. that's what it is, right? Because it's his. He put that band together, right? So he just he? gets all his old friends and right. jams. I'm, or something. I'm gonna go ahead and, and and go with what you're saying, Brian. I'm. I'm, I'm I don't. Know, I mean, I don't know for sure, but that's it. We're not. There's, there's no taking it back. That's it. It's already okay. out there. That's it. This is live, right? We're, this is, <laughs> we're streaming. Yes. <laughs> okay. Hello. Thank you for your donation. Great. We got, we got five bucks. Yeah. Did you did you come into Waves after Zach Hill had left had departed the band? Yeah, Zach was Zach was only in the band briefly, and he did they did like they recorded an EP of material that I think is you can get on like YouTube. Somebody uploaded it, but um, he wasn't in the band too long. Um, Scott Pack did we did some shows with waves when zach was still playing with them and it was just like i mean you could just imagine because zach is just this insanely creative cool just drummer that he's just he kind of like a standalone kind of artist on his own um like uh yeah i don't know nobody really plays like him he's he's just kind of got his own thing going on so it's it's a really it was cool to see for sure. But I, yeah, I was, I was a couple of drummers after him. There was, after him was uh, this guy, Billy, who played with Steven, the bass player at Waves. They played in Jay Retard's band. Um, and uh, so Billy was in the band. They, he's on that record, King of the Beach. And uh, then uh, Jacob Cooper and then me. So there's, so there's, a, there's a few in between, in between Zach. My my older brother Zach and me. So um Zach Hill, one of the best drummers of all time, in my opinion. He's he's just like watching him is nuts. And if since you're a drummer, you're just yeah, he's one of those guys if you watch him play, I don't know what he's doing. It's insane. It's insane. Just, yeah, and you're like, who how do you even I don't know. He's on another level by far, like several levels above. Uh, where most most of us live so yeah it's crazy people people talk about john bonham a lot rightfully so like yeah of course he had like major skills and what he was doing was insane as well but i i genuinely think that zach hill is right there close to him in terms of just what he's doing i think super, they're all on the same level. Inventive. yeah he's no, he's he's yeah he's he's zach he's zach, zach hill. Hill. Yeah. That, that's it we're talking about Brian Hill right now. That's 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 the hill that we're we're talking about right now. He's okay. He's he the kid can hold a beat. I don't know. Not. The kid's great. Pitchfork, <laughs> Pitchfork agrees with me. Was being a part of Waves a bit of a change of pace from the soft pack when you started playing with them? Yeah, definitely. It was more like they were very well established. Um, so. It wasn't like when I started playing with Soft Pack, they had been kind of like a San Diego band that was getting more popular. Soft Pack were um, when I joined. And then we kind of like got, you know, went through a lot of first things together after that. W- Waves had been well established for like several years. So it was more of like, I'm there to, you know, play the songs that already are they exist you know it wasn't we we try you know we we would like jam a little bit but it was more like the kind of band where people had basically complete songs or sketches of songs and they would just have them ready and waves wasn't um the kind of band that would do like a lot of rehearsing and stuff like that so there'd be a lot of like writing nate and Alex and uh, Steven, they'd write demos on their own and then like bring them to the band. So that was a different thing. And I definitely, you know, I was like more like a touring 
member and like a recording member of the band but it was the you know it's like they had their own thing long before I was involved so it kind of remained the same like unchanged my whole time I was in the band but but yeah this is pretty different yeah but it's cool it was like super fun to continue touring and, and uh I don't know the audiences were always fun those were really fun shows because they were really young kids that would come and Young kids are the best to play in front of because they just go nuts and like, like the dance and they like to show that they're having a good time. Yeah. And you're like, oh, God, this is nice. This is really, instead of people like looking bored, <laughs> this yeah. is way better. And for, you know, the arms, the arms yeah, this drop. business. Yeah. But this is, this is like, that was always um, what I missed about the old bands I would play in were like, before we were 21, you just play like these weird little punk you know do these punk these punk tours and like play people's basements and kids would go nuts and it was super fun but i don't know i missed i missed that like energy but and you get older and you're like oh i don't have the energy to do that myself but you know it's cool to play for those kids it's super fun you like to see it you're like yes all right yeah awesome. and you know, it made me want to crowd surf i'm like nobody wants to no one wants my sweaty body on i'm an old man now, so. No way. That's gross. Yeah. <laughs> I I don't. I mean, I I always see it. I go that that's that's cool. That's cool to do. Like that'd be like a cool thing to do. But also, it's like, oh man, I have a phone and I have a wallet. It's like, do people like pick your pocket? Like I've never I've never done it. So like I've, I've heard of people do pockets it you know? and stuff. It's just like I got it, but I drove here, you know, and the keys are in the pocket. Yeah. You don't want to be like yeah stranded because you had to crowd surf. You know, outside. Hey, then, do, you, do you have my keys? Who has my keys? <laughs> make an announcement. Make the band stop the show. And oh, hold it, hold it, hold it. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, yeah. That, those are the, those are the realities of. of this is the stuff here. people don't talk about. I'm glad you're bringing this stuff up. This is yeah, it's finally coming out. So Hard hitting like, news. How important is energy within a, a band that you're playing with for you, Brian? Is is that like a really staple of creating good music? It's like the energy of the music itself or in like in, in, in the people yeah. that are creating it is it does that have a an effect on the music that you're creating totally i think if you if you're excited to be, be there making it uh with the people you're playing with and i don't know that makes the hugest difference because everybody's jammed with people where it just didn't click right and you can't really force it it just doesn't it sucks like i don't know i i for me every time i've played in a band or like jammed with people and it just wasn't we weren't feeling it like it was pretty obvious and i wouldn't want to subject an audience to that but because it would just be so bad i don't know yeah i don't know it's different if you're like filling in and you're just playing with a band that, you know that's that's fine that band already has their thing and you're drumming you just don't don't fuck it up that's that's the main thing so that's enough nervous energy for me like make it fun but i don't know but yeah it's super important absolutely yeah that's one of the top reasons why i would want to continue playing with somebody would be you just make it work together it sounds good right what is the most challenging part of making music for you brian now it would be having having time to do it um and then i guess finding people that would where you yeah where you like meeting people that um or playing with people that also you just like click i don't know that's that's the hardest thing for me is getting in a situation where you feel comfortable like showing someone ideas and not feeling like oh, this is stupid or um yeah i don't know it's a rare it's a rare thing i've been really lucky i've gotten to play with the people i played with because it was always pretty easy to bring ideas and or just like work off of their ideas and kind of know what i was gonna do i don't i don't know it's hard. It's hard, but time is the major constraint now. Because I now I, I work full time. I don't even. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard getting the time to just do it even for fun. Like Dave and I have been talking about a project we want to start, and we just both of us are 
we're doing other stuff too so it's like how do you fit it in i don't know right you gotta make the time but yeah what is the most rewarding part about making music now if i get to make music now the most rewarding part it's usually i get to choose who i'm playing with and the rewarding part for me at this point it's really like basic but it's it's like the hang like we were talking about earlier like when, if i if i get to play if dave's having me fill in in fun country or i get to fill in with like a friends band or something that's like that's that's fun cuz i get to hang and i get to like get a like a little taste of that it's good it's like i get a little hit of um what i used to do all the time and it's not it doesn't feel exhausting anymore right um cuz i i like it's a break from my job and i'm like oh dude my job is so different so i like i get to i get to pretend like i'm i'm still like yeah that cool i can i can get on stage and do this like i, I get to fake it a little bit it's fun get get to reminisce you know <laughs> Um, recently you joined Best Coast on Oh, I just two, did two shows, yeah. Yeah, two shows. How was that for you? That was I mean, that was rad. They I've, I've known them for years and then toured when I was in Wigs, we did a tour together. Um and like Beth and Bob are great. And um uh, Joey and Brett are are also like super great solid solid people um uh but yeah it was great i i had i was so excited i never played that venue it's the ford theater yeah. it's a really cool venue um and it's it's just like this lovely stage setup and i was like oh man if you get, if you get to fill in for two shows with a band like this is this is you can't get better than this this is rad it's like like a nice outdoor like amphitheater and I think the Hollywood Bowl is like a mile away and um but it was great we we went through so many songs we did the we did uh the only place and we did um crazy for you like in their entirety and then a bunch of b-sides from like the era wow so it was it was fun I knew I was like familiar a few years ago I had done a, like another similar thing where they they needed a drummer to fill in for two shows at the uh, Hollywood Forever Cemetery. So those were cool shows too. But those were like, it was like a 30 minute set. I think we were only playing 30 minutes. We played the, the band churches we were opening. And so I didn't have to learn as many songs. So I was like fully immersed in like Best Coast Spotify, like playlist of all that stuff for a good month beforehand. So I was trying to like by osmosis, like learn it before we rehearsed, but it was fun and I mean yeah just getting getting to play with people that you're that you like and that you admire you know it's always fun so it was it was a blast I would I told Bob I'm like anytime that you know anytime your drummer's out of town because that's what happened he was on tour with his other band so I'm uh, like it's uh, Dylan right Dylan yeah Dylan yeah he was on your yeah, show okay. Yep. Yeah, your podcast, right? Love Dylan and and love Bob as well. That was, that was a great interview too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, I gotta great. I gotta check out Bob's interview. Bob's Bob's awesome. Bob's awesome. Dylan, Dylan I've awesome. never met in person, but um, I watched your your interview with him. He seems like a great a great dude. But they wouldn't play with someone who wasn't like a, exactly. You know, they they don't. Yeah, they wouldn't suffer fools. You know. They sure don't. Um. Now, Brian. I mean, did you ever think? that your music career would lead you from like <clears throat> playing like house shows and like small clubs and backyards to playing the fucking Ford theater, which is like a, a right around a 1200 seat venue. I mean, it's that yeah. blow your mind. Totally. Yeah. I do even like the first time I played the Che cafe, I was, I was like, Oh shit. Playing the Che cafe. I don't like, I just, yeah, I never thought, but, playing in like my friend's room in high school, like in our funk band, you know, never. <laughs> you always like imagine, like how does a band do that thing? And so you just, it's like you luck out and also you don't quit. Cause yeah, that's the only way, I don't know. But it's, there's a huge amount of luck in that. Um, Cause it's not, it's not typical. 
that's like I didn't expect any of that stuff or like but all the all the small stuff was cool like first getting like the first time to get in a recording studio was I still am like you know I'm a nerd for that stuff too but the first time you get to do it is like it's the best you know it's gotta remain like forever like this 12 year old mentality when it comes to that stuff and just be impressed that like someone cares enough to like give you the key to a recording studio that's Uh awesome that's awesome brian you're amazing brian and i'm so glad that we were able to do this it was an absolute pleasure to have you on sir but you're amazing for like asking me to do it i'm stoked you know get out of here with that brian it's absolute pleasure on my end um but before i let you go i got some promo stuff to to do here so the soft pack waves and best coast music streaming everywhere wherever the people get their music go check it out that's that's where you can find them now brian do we have anything else to promote that is that that is coming up how can the people support you i don't have any active projects at the moment go back back in time go back in time get a a ticket (laughs) yeah let me theater trying to sell it out oh yeah yeah that would have been yeah that that was those gigs were fun um let me just preemptively promote the 20 year anniversary of crazy for you and maybe dylan's gonna play it though so but i'll be drum teching for dylan if that happens all right and if, if bob approves and then it's all it's all up to bob should the people go follow you on instagram and keep up to date with, with what you're doing oh yeah, you can, yeah if you want it's a lot of it's a lot of dog content now but good deal either way she, you know uh but yeah it's it's uh brian candy is my which is my kids in the hall reference to brain candy but good good show so people can go follow you on instagram though brian to go to go to keep up to date with what you're doing and everything. yeah I, yeah if, especially if i if i wind up doing more music stuff which i hope to do um this year i hope to do some more stuff trying to try to get as much stuff out before you move to hawaii yes so yeah oh yeah and then it's all it's all slack key guitar once i get there it's all going to traditional like very nice really looking forward to that i am too actually that's the more you mention it i'm kind of feeling it matt Lincoln lives there so i'm gonna hang out with matt's dad that's what i'm gonna do rad new project really looking forward to that oh my god we gotta do that i'm gonna i'm gonna call his dad bill i'm gonna call him up there we go we're gonna we're, we're, we're already getting it together uh brian I'll, I'll see you when i help you move to um to, to hawaii I'll, I'll help you package up all this stuff and i'll, I'll see you then um but until okay. then it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you i'm gonna stop recording this i'll talk to you in a minute brian thank you sir all right thanks jacob